Hey everyone, welcome to the Tech Seeking Human podcast. And many of us are exploring the future of AI and algorithms and data privacy. And should we be worried about our own civil rights as it comes to data protection? And in order to get a little bit better understanding, we've enlisted the support of a global expert, a professor and a thought leader in Nathaniel Raymond. Nathaniel, welcome to the podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've never been on an Australian podcast before, so this is a unique cultural experience. <laughs> this is pretty exciting stuff. Whereabouts are you based then? Uh, I'm based in New Haven, Connecticut. Okay, very good. Now, we asked you to record a couple of things before we got started on this podcast and said, do you have this app? Do you have that app? Do you have that app? And I laughed and chuckled because as a data privacy expert, uh, you didn't have these apps. Yeah, I, I <laughs> very intentionally don't have those apps. Uh, you know, everything, everything is training data um, for something uh, that you can't see until told otherwise. Let's go straight into that. Should we be worried about, you know, everyone is focused on big data, every company's collecting it. It's a little bit of the wild west at the moment without government regulations. What should we be worried about as the average citizen? Um, I, I sort of, in my brain, I have two baskets. Um, there's the, the obvious basket of things to worry about, and then there's the subtle basket. Um, in the obvious basket are, you know, the, the usual litany of, is my location being tracked? Um, what, what do the terms of service on the apps on my phone actually say? And, you know, that's been done to death. Let's put that aside. In the surprising subtle basket, is really the, the question of uh, what data is being collected about you that puts you in a group or a community you may not know you are a part of. And uh, when we look back in the history of data protection, um, it comes primarily relatively recently within the past um, at most 75 years and it was primarily built around protecting the data of individuals. But now with algorithms, there is a whole other type of data. So that individual data, just acronym alert, is called PII, personally identifiable information. And the obvious bucket is PII issues. In the surprising, you don't think about it much bucket, is what I would call DII. In the, the, the DII, demographically identifiable information um, bucket, we are really dealing with the fuel in the engine of artificial intelligence. And for artificial intelligence to function, it is not trying to figure out your social security number. It's trying to figure out what category um, you may fit in. And often, those categories are imagined. And what I mean by that is that AI and machine learning can think of combinations of attributes that go beyond the way in which we organize people, <laughs> male, female, um, ethnicity, religion, geographic location. And it is those combinations of demographic attributes that in many ways are creating the most pernicious and damaging types of harms we are seeing in the 21st century. Um, there's an obvious example of that. 2016, the U.S. presidential election, Cambridge Analytica, and the use of Facebook data to create uh, communities of of people who with common political affiliations through um, psychometric targeting that didn't even think of themselves as a group. And so the question is, how do we um, regulate the use of data about communities that may not even quote um, exist or know that they are a community? That's a yeah, it's a lot to get your head around because you have the, a conversation with an average person and they go, oh, why would these companies care about me individually? I don't care that they, because there's no one sitting there looking at me individually, but looking at 
the group there is. And it just made me think, actually, as you were telling that story, I go to the football a lot. And imagine being segregated at the football into a group that you didn't know that you were being defined and being made to sit in that particular area and then being served only certain types of beer or food or whatever based on the decision of whatever the algorithm is. Like in my in my head, that's sort of how I see it playing out. In this Facebook example, as you're saying, people don't know that they're a part of it. And there were two parts I was thinking. One is, it, is it actually very good at getting the groups right which is the one part. And then the second part is, if it is good at getting the groups right, it's, it's, it's both good and bad. It's good that it's great. It can get us into a group, but it's bad in that you don't know you're a part of that group and you're going to get served a certain number of information or whatever. So it's pretty dangerous stuff, right? So I think there are three harms that can come from DII. And uh, all examples of harm uh, involving... AI, I think, fall in one of these three categories. You can be targeted, you can be exploited, Mm. and you can be excluded. Mm. And exclusion can be intentional and it can be accidental, but it can still be harmful. And so um, let's talk about targeting. Targeting is pretty obvious, Um, trying to figure out when, where (laughs) um, somebody is. And we often think about Edward Snowden in the uh, revelations around NSA surveillance in terms of surveilling individuals. Um, And then there's this book here, Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism. And it's really focused on this idea of the individual being targeted, Um, but targeting groups in terms of predictive targeting um, is really where uh, AI, not is going, but it's already there. And um, targeting is really a prerequisite to do exploitation. You can't exploit a group or a subject if you can't see them. Um, And then exclusion, as I said before, is that you can intentionally try to, and we already have a very good example of this, to try to prevent uh, someone from accessing services or prevent someone from being included in advertising. In the United States, uh, the Fair Trade, uh, sorry, Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, fined Facebook for excluding uh, minorities from housing ads for mortgages. And that was considered a violation of uh, the Fair Housing Act because they were not equitably advertising to uh, individuals on Facebook who were part of groups. That's an exclusion harm. And it didn't involve them saying, I'm not going to advertise to Bob because he's African-American. It was saying, I'm not going to advertise to those that fall into this demographic uh, catchment or category. That's an exclusion harm. Can I play back a really simple scenario? Because most people, if you, if the average person on the street, if you said, well, we're going to exclude you from particular ads. So this is what we're mostly talking about, right? Ads. And you kind of go, oh, yeah, well, so I'm not going to get the t shirt or the shoes or whatever. But it's actually a lot more harmful than just the ads. Can you give us the example? Like go, you just did then, gave us an example of like exclusion based on on housing. And I've also seen other ones where like if you Google search pictures of, um, I can't remember what it was. Was it like legal profession or, you, or you, you know, like as kids growing up today, they search for something and they get a prejudice view of or a stereotypical view of what is already being done in the past. Therefore, that it shapes their future. Um, I can give you a, <laughs> how much time do we have? Um, you know, it, let's look at uh, COVID. There are um, too many examples. <laughs> if you're if you're doing cell phone tracking to understand potential exposure uh, related to COVID, and th- this has been done globally, um, tracking. Um, call detail records to understand 
where people are moving and okay well what happens with that if people don't have a cell phone they're excluded from the transmission patterns that are used to decide things like location of testing sites like distribution of vaccine like mitigation uh, factors and so when we begin to move into what computers can see about groups um, in a predictive way, or not just predictive, but in an extrapolated way, we can make populations digitally invisible. It's not that people are trying to be excluded from COVID testing or vaccine access. It's that as we increasingly rely on digitally extracted um, snapshots of communities, those that are not online become forgotten. Are they tracking cell phones and where people are going and related to COVID? Yep. And in search terms, uh, Google is doing it. Um, I uh, have been uh, supporting COVID responses here locally in the United States. My, I um, lecture both at the Jackson Institute of Global Affairs at Yale and also at the Yale School of Public Health in the epidemiology department. And so I wear two hats. And uh, uh, states um, are using uh, internet analytic data and cell phone data to understand uh, movement of populations as it relates to COVID exposure. Yes. That's a good thing though, or a bad thing? Uh, it's a complicated thing yeah. <laughs> because uh, the, the question is, um, how, how do you, what does working mean? Um, how do we know this is working? Um, I think these types of analytics are good to understand uh, sort of top level, not highly granular decision-making, but um, a, as a, someone in the humanitarian response field, um, I've seen call detail records be highly valuable in terms of understanding macro level movements of people. That's good. Um, when you have the right protections on it. Um, let me give you an example of where it's bad. <laughs> uh, in 2015, a variety of humanitarian agencies used call detail records in the Ebola crisis in West Africa uh, to try to contact trace potential Ebola exposure using cell phone tower data. And they used an algorithm that had been, uh, I believe, used in Korea around the MERS virus outbreak a couple of years before. The problem is in Korea, the cell phone towers are very close together. And in West Africa, they were very far apart. Mm. And so suddenly <laughs> they um, deployed this algorithm into a place where it, was, where it was built for urban areas in East Asia. And suddenly it's in West Africa. Um, so the triangulation was off. Also, it wasn't built for Ebola. And it violated national privacy laws in Liberia and Sierra Leone. You can read a great report about this by my colleague and friend, Sean Martin McDonald, Ebola, Big Data Disaster. And so it's not that it was a bad idea. Um, it's that we didn't have standards for its execution. It was technically wrong. It was wrong from an epidemiological perspective and it violated local law. Um, as I say all the time, uh, we, we do things in Africa, we being uh, researchers and do-gooders from the North, um, do things in Africa that might win you a Nobel Peace Prize, but could get you arrested in Australia or the United States. And that double standard, we shouldn't be okay with it. Yeah. So it I come back to the adage that if you've done nothing wrong, then why should you care whether you're being tracked? And the more data that, and this isn't my necessarily opinion, right? I'm playing back maybe what the majority is, which is funny now doing this back to someone who, you know, majorly warning me about using data as a majority. But um, so it's okay for me to be tracked because I'm in a group. And then when it comes to COVID, I'm like, okay, the more data they can process, the better, hopefully, because it could make us safer. But then it, it isn't, isn't this back to an argument of like, 
open standards or an open AI where it's like, okay, you're allowed to, and in the example you just gave, you should use the algorithms because it can help us make better decisions, but make them open and accountable, even because the government isn't sure necessarily how to do it and let experts analyze it. So collectively we can all get better. As long as it's an explainable and understandable AI, then shouldn't that be okay? Or is that closer to okay? I'm sort of trying to get to like, what's the solution? So um, literally um, today with uh, a colleague of mine from Carnegie Mellon, we're working on this blog that will be coming out soon from World Economic Forum. And we're talking about the political economy of evidence when it relates to data governance, which is a very hoity-toity academic way to say, um, companies control what evidence gets released about the products that they built and the algorithmic products they built. So back to your, your point, Dave, which is, um, okay, yes, it would be better if uh, there was a standard of openness, of auditability, et cetera, for, for algorithms. Okay, who decides that standard? How do we know we have enough evidence to create that standard? And who enforces that standard? Um, that's the great question of our time. And it, and it's not an Australian question, it's not an American question, it's not a European question or a Chinese question, it's a global question. And as long as we have jurisdictions um, that are making up their own approaches, which is the current state with GDPR in Europe, um, with Australia with its own data protection uh, regulations, uh, we are a really, um, just delaying the inevitable. Uh, as soon as we can get to interoperable global standards, um, the better everyone is gonna be. Um, I wanna ask you a question. What's data? Information online, I guess, is what I think. Of yeah, information, information, meta, signals. I ask this question all the time of my undergrads in my data governance lecture. God, it's awkward being a question on us. <laughs> They, well, they all, all the, the young Yaleys say information. Their hand shoots up and I'm like, D data can be information, but information is not necessarily data. Um, the way I define data is that data is the record of a characteristic. And I think this is a really helpful exercise when we talk about AI to break it down to the beginning which is data is not new. Um, there is data on cuneiform tablets found in the <laughs> wreckage of Babylon. That is data. It is the record of a characteristic on cuneiform tablets. It is a, um, a record of a characteristic um, on the tablet. It is also a record of a characteristic on what's being back from the Hubble telescope. Mm -hmm. um, that's all data. What's in a computer is data. What is in this book is data. I take a stick and scratch on the ground. It's data um, because it is simply the record of a characteristic. When we turn that record of a characteristic into a insight or an output that supports decision, that supports action, that's when we get to information, right? The latitude and longitude of your local Starbucks is data. The directions you need to take to get there is information. And so the, the point is this, is that all algorithms are, all AI is, is basically uh, ways to develop shortcuts of organizing records of characteristics to ideally <laughs> um, support decisions. That's, that's what it is. And so the, the, the question is, when we regulate AI, what are we really talking about regulating? We're talking about regulating how records of characteristics are collected, <laughs> how they are processed, <laughs> including cleaned, how they are basically analyzed, how they are shared, and how they are stored. Okay, and these five things, what is this? This is the data life cycle. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, basically what, what we're really talking about is the, the limits of, of how that life cycle is allowed to happen aware, around what records of characteristics. And in the 20th century, those records of characteristics were about individuals and the agency of individuals to control the release of those records of characteristics. Now, computers can gather those records of characteristics and begin to imagine what they might be without actually having them released. Mm. So how do we, where do you think we are in that life cycle of regulation? Like, do you think we're not even at the beginning or are we, like, are we learning from things like Ebola? Like, do, is that going to keep happening, do you think? Or are we actually learning from it? Uh, I, we know we have a problem now. Yeah. But, and, and, and I don't say that to be trite. Uh, and that's been a significant advancement. Like if I went back, we go back in what I'll call short-term time machine. We can only go back five-year increments. We go back to 2016, 2015. And pe people would generally think that this is going well. <laughs> I'm holding up my iPhone. That uh, social media is a positive. That... Uh, the increasing use of algorithms to support advertising, to support offers, to support decisions of individuals um, is a positive. I think now, and we have data on this, there was a recent survey from a, uh, a democracy institute in Germany that does this democracy index every year. In the top four threats to democracy is social media, globally. And this was just the, this past week. And so that's a change. That's, and that's an important change, is that now we've gone from, um, oh, wow, <laughs> um, world of tomorrow ride at Disney World in terms of how we think about information communication technologies to, oh, wait, Jurassic Park. <laughs> so we've, we've, we've made that turn. Now the question is, what do we do about it? And, and also, not only what do we do about it, who is the we? There are extremes. So can we can we explore the, the threat of democracy um, as it relates to social media? Because it's a pretty good topic. I was sitting there going, yeah, social media are a threat. I go, yeah, big deal. Instagram, they serve me ads every now and then. You know, I buy like a smart lock or something, big deal. But it's way more than that. I'm not that stupid. But um, uh, the when it comes to the extremes of what's happened, like in the last three or four years, I thought it was my fault, me traveling around the world. I arrived in Europe and they did Brexit. And then I arrived in the US and you elected Trump. And then Australia was, we're pretty left, right. So almost straight down the middle. So it didn't really matter. But something else happened in the Philippines, I think, where they voted one extreme direction in the other direction. It's like these wild swings are happening in politics, it seems to me. Is that a, th a possibility of the social media influence coming in? Like when you say the biggest threat to democracy is social media. Help us understand more of that. Uh, I, I, what, what, I wouldn't say the biggest threat, but we've entered this moment where um, we used to talk about, we still talk about cyberspace, right? Yeah. I don't think cyberspace is the term we should use anymore. Uh, and my, my colleagues at Graphica uh, and I use the same term and uh, it is cyber social terrain. And I believe that when we look at what's happened with Brexit, what's happened in the United States with Trump and what's happened in terms of ex the, the use of social media by extremist groups around the world is we are fighting for control of a cyber social terrain. And that cyber social terrain is created by the intersection of infrastructure uh, societal networks in quote real life, though the internet is real life, um, and informatics, which is information about flows of information. And so rather than if we go back to like after 9 11, 
where the question was, is someone going to fly planes into the World Trade Center? Is someone going to put anthrax in the mail? Um, the question now is, is someone going to weaponize information about flows of information from social demographics <laughs> um, and social networked demographics and try to control the infrastructure by which those social groups build reality? And the answer over and over again now is yes. It's cheap, it's disavowable, and it's effective as hell. <laughs> and so um, the, the fact of the matter we, we see from some of the research by colleagues of mine, like Kate Starber from University of Washington, Seattle, she did this incredible study of Black Lives Matter movements uh, during the, uh, uh, before George Floyd's murder and showed that Russian <laughs> IRA, Internet Research Agency, uh, trolls had uh, penetrated both the conservative Republican conversation about BLM and the liberal conversation about BLM. It wasn't about changing someone's minds. It, they were trying to sow division mm. in both groups. So this is the thing. The, these activities are not about getting you to believe something different. It's about pulling you apart from other people. It's picking a fight. Mm. Yes. It's picking a fight. It's inciting each side. They said this, they said this, they said this, go get them. They're saying that, go get them. I call this meta conflict or meta war. It, it's war by creating war. <laughs> it's conflict mm. that is about causing conflict uh and the fact is that it's highly effective um let's go back to uh 2007 2008 uh, have you ever heard of the, what's called the bronze night i haven't no no and it, it sounds like an axe body spray i will admit that but <laughs> bronze night is an incident that happened in Tallinn, estonia yeah. uh related to the movement of a statue uh, that was a monument to Soviet war dead. And it resulted in a multi-dimensional <laughs> um, cyber attack on Estonia, which is often known as E-Estonia because it was one of the earliest and most wired uh, governments in Europe. And uh, what happened is there was misinformation, disinformation, hate speech. There were attacks on government systems, on ATMs, on uh, mul multiple uh, pieces of infrastructure. And though it has never been formally stated, it was likely by Russia. And if you look at the Bronze Night uh, incident in Estonia, it's really an off-Broadway premiere for what we see as we go forward in Ukraine, the US election in 2016, and then 2017 Rohingya genocide, alleged Rohingya genocide in Myanmar, and on and on and on. Uh, the entities that are using these methods are getting better and better at them, and we uh, have yet to respond, we being democracies in a coordinated way. And we probably fuel it because if I think about television networks and I didn't watch them in the US because there were too many options for TV. So when it came to watching the TVs in the US, I was like, well, I'm not watching any because I don't know how to use the remote because there's 6,000 channels. But I come back to Australia where we have three and I see how bad our media is where they incite drama. And this, in a sense, is drama. It's like they're causing drama on one side that causes drama on the other side, which causes extremism, which makes people march down a street to go crazy at the other group. And then the news is the first one there to go insightful riot happening down at, you know, Malvern Central. And there's like three people and a grandma there and there's not actually any drama. But it seems like we haven't quite got our head around the, the reason to calm and also maybe the understanding like what do we need to do to educate oh, i've been talking to my kids about 
educating school kids about how your data is manipulated, how the what you're being served in ads is biased, how what Google gives you isn't necessarily true, why Facebook shouldn't be trusted, all these sort of things that kids should learn. But what should we do now? Because it actually seems the extremism is, maybe extremism's always been there, but it just seems easier and we're more extreme now. Therefore, what's the, is there a, two questions, and I know this was a long rant, but Claire's used to this. The, the, first, the first part is like, what do we do about it? No, maybe that just is it. What, what do we do about this? Like, or, and is there a tipping point? Is there a tipping point where we go, we as a society now have gone too far? For, for me, it, you know, I, do, you, do you know um, the song about little bunny Fufu? We used to sing it when I was at camp. Yes. This is, oh, yes. you do know it? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say that's three strikes were out. <laughs> the little bunny Fufu was hopping through the forest, yeah, scooping up the field mice and bopping them on the head. And down came the good fairy. And she said, little bunny Fufu, I don't want to see you scooping up the field mice and bopping them on the head. I'll give you three chances. And then I'll turn you into a goon, right? <laughs> um, we are on the verge of being turned into a goon, <laughs> which is... Um, we, we have been given three chances over and over again. And uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, what more uh, incentive do we need? Is it because we don't want to believe? We don't want people, people don't want to give up on their, well, I mean, is that it? Like, is it just it's that as, simple? It's as big as nu- nuclear weapons. Should, it, where's the World Health Organization for AI yeah. in a way? Like, and maybe they're, it, they're is some sort of organization that I'm not... Okay. They're not loud enough, if there is. <laughs> yeah. If we think about the, the dawn of the international system, it was a response to World War II, and it was a response... <laughs> Hi, June. That's June <laughs> back you here in the background. Um, oh, and, um, yeah, he's banging on about yeah. data again. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Dad. Yeah, well, well, yeah, what, what she's saying is that stop talking about data and start doing something about dinner. Exactly. He goes, you humans, you've had three chances. And, and so, so when we, we look at why we have the United Nations Security Council, why we have the United Nations itself, um, that international system was a responsive uh, act um, dealing with uh, the, basically the reality of what happened in World War II, but also a prospective act to try to prevent what could happen in a unchecked nuclear arms race. And we're in a moment now where often we compare the weaponization of data to nuclear weapons. Um, they, they are in no way... Hey, June. Hi. Can you lie down? They're in no way related um, except for one thing is that it, they rep, they both represented a pivot point in terms of the transformation of the international system because they represented new options for states and non-state actors that rearranged power hierarchies. We are at a moment now where the weaponization of information and data, this meta conflict within the cyber social terrain has rearranged the possibilities of power for state and non-state actors in a way that there's no going back. The concrete is hardening on a new world order that is based on fighting not over terrain, physical terrain, but fighting over how information flows and why. Yoy. How does the Geneva Conventions apply when we are no longer fighting over city blocks, but we're fighting over analytics about those records of a characteristic. We're we're fighting about the information that allows us to target, to exploit and exclude. Um, How do you put a red cross on a server? How do you, um, uh, is it a war crime um, (laughs) when you attack cell phones? Are there smart enough people outside of the big tech companies who are present company excluded, who are making enough noise or 
can help set the jurisdiction. It sort of feels a little bit like, and I might be completely off here, but you know, I'm reading a lot about AI at the moment and there's an arms race and people are getting paid an absolute squillion to work at the big tech companies. So the smartest data scientists in the world are part of the uh, collection and anal- anal- analyzing the data. But in the government and legal profession, they're too far apart. It feels a little bit like, you know, we saw that Senate inquiry and they were sitting there and having to explain what Facebook is. Like, it's not that bad, is it? Well, I, you're raising the critical point, Dave, which is um, the, the, the great problem here is we have mistaken what type of problem we have. We think this is a technological problem. It's a political one. Um, Frederick Douglass, in talking about the abolition of slavery, uh, said in the 19th century in America that power... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, what is the exact quote? Power concedes nothing without a demand. And the the question now is what is the demand? And also, there's a second question. Who is the power? And we are talking about the power of entities in terms of technological companies that rivals whole continents of nation states. Mm. And in many ways, our system of international law was not designed with the idea that the primary uh, actor would not be a sovereign government. (laughs) Um, If we look at Facebook and Google, their EULAs, their end user license agreements are doing more to shape international legal agreements about the world in which we live than international law created by states. Just think about that for a moment. That we have in the past, you know, <laughs> um, four years with the, the alleged Rohingya genocide in Myanmar, in which 750,000 people approximately were displaced from their homes and uh, allegedly a quarter of a million of pe- people were um, Uh, likely killed, up to a quarter million people likely killed, due to incitement from Facebook Messenger, right? When that type of incitement was done in Rwanda, we had the media trial and people were put in jail for decades and are still there now for using the radio Mm. to command and control coordinate the Rwandan genocide. When we look at World War II, Julius Stryker was hung um, for uh, using newspapers to help incite the Holocaust. Okay, now we have Facebook Messenger (laughs) has been behind the first social media genocide. And you know what? It probably wasn't illegal. The argument of shutting the Twitter account down of Trump, is that one of the first examples of where it's like, we don't agree with your approach to communication and this will bring up some controversy, right? Because people will go, well, it's freedom of speech and he should be allowed to communicate in any way that he wants. But Twitter, for whatever reason, decided that they should shut his account down. Uh, inciting violence is not protected speech, even in the United States, which has the most ex- expansive, arguably the most expansive freedom of speech in the world. Um the, the line is <laughs> in the United States is freedom of speech does not allow you to yell fire in a crowded movie theater when there is no fire. Mm-hmm. And it does not allow you to um, call for specific targeted violent acts. And when we look at international law, there is the specific crime of ICG, incitement to the crime of genocide which prohibits the effort to incite violence against a group. In the case of Myanmar, those who allegedly incited that violence violated that principle, that legal principle of ICG, incitement to the crime of genocide. But the question is, what did Facebook violate? Hmm. Likely it violated nothing (laughs) because it provided 
the means for those who incited the genocide to do so. If you provide the communication channel, shouldn't you be accountable for what goes on in your communication channel? Well, yes, but in the United States, we have something called uh, <laughs> CDA 230. Have you ever heard that before? I think we had a, yes, yes, very, very briefly, you gave me a small background to it, but for our audience, explain it and how it came about. Have you seen The Wolf of Wall Street? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so Leonardo DiCaprio's character sued Prodigy. Um, do you remember Prodigy, the early online uh, access service? Sued Prodigy for um, a message on a chat room that uh, his financial firm was going to be raided by um, the Security and Exchange Commission. And that um, caused punitive damages uh, against uh, Prodigy. Uh, in response to uh, that case, which is known as the Stratton Oakmont case, there was a major court decision in the 1990s um, that basically um, put the fear of God <laughs> in every single internet, early internet company that they were gonna get sued for content. And so, uh, two members of Congress, Ron Wyden and Chris Cox, a Democrat and a Republican, wrote an amendment to something called the Communications Decency Act, and that amendment is called Section 230. And Section 230 indemnifies uh, basically online platforms from the content that's posted on them. And uh, Jeff Kossif at the U.S. Naval Academy wrote a book called 26 Words I believe it's called 26 words that created the internet. And what he argues is that those 26 words basically created the modern shape of the internet, not just in the United States, but globally. And it indemnified platform companies from being sued. Damn. So there's no precedent for this because this is like collaborative, open source, say whatever you want. In my head, I was going, well, the media is regulated. Radio is regulated. TV is regulated. But you don't get an opportunity on radio really to get on and say whatever you want. No. You can go down the street and say whatever you want. Well, you this is just a version of saying whatever you want, but it's online. You can get on a podcast and say whatever you want. You can get on a podcast and say whatever you want, but then you're still going to get published somewhere and they might shut you down. Yeah. But. Get ready for fancy legal term. What it has done effectively is has prevented the development of what's called a duty of care. And duty of care in tort law is how we figure out who has a responsibility to prevent harm. And so if you're a school bus driver, you have a duty of care to not drink and drive <laughs> while you are taking the kids to school. I'm like if, water. If, if, yeah, and we, we would hope that that is a widely understood duty of care. Um, okay, the question is, what duty of care do internet providers have um, and social media platforms have for preventing the harms we're talking about? Well, in many cases, we actually don't know because there has been a lack of court precedent to uh, determine what the platforms are liable for but we're talking more political right because criminal they do regulate to be fair to them obviously they regulate criminal activity like you know child pornography or you know someone you know murderous crimes and things like this yeah. But they're not really touching the political and inciting violence and groups and like, like uh, do they shut down extremist groups? Like, should you be allowed to have an extremist group with radical views on a Facebook platform? Like, who regulates that? Who actually decides, no, sorry, you're too extreme to be allowed to have a group? The company does. And you, you know, I don't know, religious way left, you're okay. Like, who makes that decision? Is that what the hard part is? Is that why they're going, oh? Well, the fact of the matter is that we have... In the United States, we, we don't have a lot of things we need to have. Um, <laughs> one of them is 
uh, a DPA, a data protection agency. We don't have a data protection agency in the United States. We are probably the only major developed country without a DPA. Wow. Sweden developed a data protection act and a data protection agency. They were, I believe, the first um, in the very early 70s. Ironically, America um, was one of the earliest and most advanced in terms of something called the Privacy Act in 1974. We did a really good job early on, but then basically since then we have basically, basically been uh, following the rest of the world, including Australia and Europe. And um, we don't have a DPA, we have indemnification for platforms. Uh, and we also, yes, we do have things like COPA, which is, you refer to in terms of um, Child Online Privacy Protection Act. Um, but there's a lot of specific regulations that you have in Australia that we don't have, particularly as it relates to kids. Australia has some of the strongest child online protections in the world. Yeah, yeah, which is good. Um, but we're also a some very small voice in a large crowd that it seems to me like we won't get a tipping point until some more powerful groups get together. Like GDPR was probably brought about and I'm not as familiar with it as, as others would be, but because all of Europe got banded together and said, right, we're imposing these restrictions and, and this is how the world is going to be. But until America goes, they're the ones with the platforms the powerful platforms right now and they're uh, not regulated in the same way. I mean, you take the example of like Facebook and Australia. We, I don't even know what happened and I should know what happened, but it seemed like we had a little bit of a standoff and Facebook basically just turned around and went, oh, well, bad luck. What are you going to do about it? Australia kind of went, um, okay. And they even threatened well, they, to shut the platform down. They're like, well, we don't really care about Australia. At least they took a stand. You know. Yeah, fair. Yeah. But do do you think you'll get, will you get a data protection agency and will that be the point where it's sort of like, like, isn't there, it feels like there's a little bit of an uprising. It feels like there's a like, hey, you guys need to explain your algorithm a little more and you guys need to explain, there seems to be like they're being held a little bit more accountable. I mean, in the past, companies these size were forced to be broken apart. And I'm not advocating that that should happen, but I'm just saying shut, they've got to be more accountable. So I, I think we've engaged in a conflation um, where we, 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 we've become fixated on the power of these companies mm. and rightfully so. But we often think that if we break up their power, then we will suddenly have the responsible use and the ethical and legal use of data. <laughs> and that's where we've engaged in a conflation. We have two problems. And the problems have come together and made a giant problem baby. <laughs> and pro problem one is the power of these corporations. And that is a trust uh, in what we call in the United States antitrust law, which is about breaking up large monopolies. The other part is that going back to the beginning of our conversation is that we don't have uh, regulations for data about groups. And we also haven't translated many of our PII regulations uh, about individual data into the age of the algorithm, the age of AI. And so we have two problems and we have to solve the power problem. <laughs> we also have to solve the group data problem. And, and, and the we is not just the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is, is that GDPR as it currently stands is not sufficient. Um, I, I, have you ever heard of the coelacanth? Mm -hmm. It is, it's the fish that I think it actually was found off the coast of Australia. Oh. It, it was believed to be a major evolutionary step in leading to, um, life on land. And it had, um, sort of these legs <laughs> and it would pull itself up and breathe a little and then go back into the water. Um, I see the GDPR as a coelacanth evolutionarily of data protection regulations that it is going to lead because it exists it will lead to other evolutionary steps by itself it is a fish kind of with legs <laughs> that's breathing for a moment and then going back in the water and what i mean by that is that it has the beginning 
of concepts that represent the next generation of data governance, particularly uh, thinking about DPIAs, data protection impact assessments, beginning to develop a vocabulary conceptually yeah. about how organizations think of their duty to um, those whose data they control. Thinking about data controllers, data processors, data subjects. These are big steps forward. GDPR Xeroxing it and sending it around the world will not solve our problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the fact is, is that we, we have to go back to uh, that post-World War II UN moment in the sense that it requires a broader um, coming together um, of, of nations and it will in many ways exacerbate conflict if that happens because it will draw a line clearly between those who endorse a rights-based approach to data governance in those countries that do not and we know some of their names china and russia yeah mm. but we can't keep uh, my whole view is that we can't keep um dodging the bullet um meaning that um we can't act like somehow there is a magical moment where Russia, China, and the democracies of the world are going to be on the same page about this. We need to draw that line, and then uh, we need to live with the consequences of drawing that line. We're, we're, we're consuming a lot of information. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Um, but we're, we're consuming a lot here, and, and there's a bit of a, what do we do? What do we, we're at this, very early dawn of regulating and setting the... We're 11 a.m. We're 11, 10.30. 30. Maybe we're having like our second coffee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's about, well, that's it's about where we are right now. We're a little optimistic yeah, at this that's, time, that's, actually. Absolutely. Just to pick it's things just up. just before brunch yeah. on the weekend. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's not too early for a mimosa. So we no, can a couple of champagnes and, and life can be pretty optimistic for the rest. Yeah, make us feel yeah. optimistic. Let us, let us leave this with a little bit of optimism. So, so what I think about a lot is that, um, so bear with me here, that I, when, and I look at responses to what information communication technologies have done, and I think there's sort of five responses. One is what I call soft gov, which is the idea, and this is what corporations like. Corporations like soft gov which is we're going to have an ethics conference. Mm -hmm. We are going to develop a consortium. We're going to have an online network to talk about issues. Okay, that's soft gov. Um, hard gov is we're going to prosecute. We're going to do legislation. We are going to regulate. Okay, the third camp is what I would call the revolutionaries, which is it's not soft gov or hard gov. It's Bitcoin. It is data trusts. We need to develop new legal and new technological modalities are going to save us. Those are the revolutionaries. We will have a distributed ledger that will figure you out. Okay, great. And then the fourth is the refusalists. And once again, Shoshana Zuboff, just happened to have this book here, um, which is, it's not a question of soft gov or hard gov or a revolution in governance. It's a question of refusing to let the technologies into parts of our lives. And that could relate to a hard gov approach, which is to prohibit, right? Um, we're just not going to allow technology to do X, Y, or Z. And then there's the, the fifth camp, which is where I think I am, which are the translationists, or you can call us neo-normalists, which, which basically, okay, we've been through technological transformations. And at each technological transformation, it's about taking the norms that existed before it and translating them to the current moment. It's not about wholesale refusal. It's not about wholesale revolution. I, I, I would say we're the radical centrists, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is that we have to take what existed before and engage in an intentional process to upgrade those norms. Mm -hmm. And um, we see more evidence of that being the approach 
um, a combination of translation and hard gov. Um, um, and then eventually once, you know, what I've learned is that it's not about one ring to rule them all, dorky Lord of the Rings reference. It is really these five things are repertoires. They all have different moments where they matter. In some cases, um, refusalism may be the way to go to say, we're not going to use spatial recognition technology in policing. That's a type of refusalism, right? Um, revolution. Hey, we actually may need to develop a new type of currency for certain things or a new type of way of moving data into the legal um, uh, entities that don't exist yet. Okay. Um, but it's not really, um, at the end of the day, what you want to listen for is anyone who says that one of these camps is going to solve it all is probably selling you something. At the end of the day, it's going to be these five repertoires used in the right order, often one enabling the other. It's, I, I don't golf, but it's like golfing. We have to select the right golf club for the right, <laughs> the right hole on the course. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now we have a bunch of golfers who are only using one golf club <laughs> at a time. Um, let, let's end on the optimistic note. At the end of the day, this is a political problem that we have wrongly called a technological one. And it will be resolved when democracies um, demand that their governments make it a priority in an organized way. When we look at revolu revolutionary, and the, here I am saying revolution, when we look at major leaps forward in environmental protection, major leaps forward in uh, uh, suffrage, major leaps forward in other types of civil rights, it happens because people organized and they made their demand clear. We need to do the same now. It's digital transformation of politics and government. Every company's been through that digital transformation. Now it's time for them to go through the same thing. Or political transformation of the digital. There you go. Yeah. I love it. Well, wow. so this is a really deep topic. It's only the future of human freedom, Dave. So yeah. I, I don't know what you're talking about. We might have to have another. We need another mimosa. Yeah. We weren't really, uh, we had whiskey in our cups here. It wasn't coffee. Not true. <laughs> it's not true at all. Thank you, Nathaniel. We really appreciate taking the time today and uh, have a great rest of the year. Well, thank you all. It's been a real pleasure.